This morning's Dhamma talk, I thought I'd like to take the opportunity to cover something that I wasn't able to finish, uh, well, to do completely earlier this year and late last year. And that was talking about, do people remember what I was talking about? Ah, very good, Adrian, very good, very quick. So one of the aspects that I, didn't, I did cover, but just in brief, is of course right livelihood, sama ajiva. And this is very important because when you look at it, really, isn't it? Probably you could say, could you say about a third of our lives, if we were working, is spent at work, you know, and that's a lot of time. So it's not as if we can put the practice on hold while we're at work <laughs> and say, well, this is not the, uh, this is not the, uh, the Buddhist centre, so uh, I can just wait until Sunday or whenever I come. So this is a very important thing. So I'd just like to, as I did uh, for all those talks, actually give a quotation about the Noble Eightfold Path as a sort of beginning uh, because it links them all together. And I think I used this one the first time, actually, first talk I gave. And it says, of all the paths, the Eightfold Path is the best. Of all the truths, the Four Noble Truths are the best. Of all things, passionlessness is the best. Of men, of all men, the seeing one, the Buddha, is the best because of his wisdom. So very important, as I mentioned, you know, we spend a third, perhaps about a third of our time at work. So it's a very important aspect of our life. And too often you don't hear talks about right livelihood that much, actually. So I think it's something well worth the whole talk. And this is, of course, the fifth factor, the Noble Eightfold Path. So you have uh, right view, then you have uh, right intention or right uh, motivation, Ajahn Brahm's calling it now. Then you have right speech, right action, and right livelihood. And then you have uh, right effort, right mindfulness, and then right samadhi or right stillness, as often called by Ajahn Brahm. So, so it's the fifth factor. And I like to emphasize, you know, that these factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, we're often pictured as a wheel, isn't it, with spokes, eight spokes. And it needs all those spokes for the wheel to work. Sometimes we, we'd like to leave out some of the spokes, but the wheel will get very weak <laughs> and may, won't fulfill its purpose. Because if, for instance, we decide, well, you know, some are ajiva, uh, right, livelihood's too difficult while I'm at work, I, you know, that's a third of our lives. And that's where we're creating a lot of the karma, good and bad karma in our lives. So it's very important to, to th consider this and to realize, I know for myself and I know most of us do this, we can compartmentalize our lives. We have our lives in little boxes. Work is one box, home is another box, maybe the BSV is another box. And our behavior may be quite different between the, these various boxes. And you see this, you know, people tell me in Sri Lanka, and they tell me here too, that when people come to the temple, when they come to the Buddhist society, very well behaved. But when they're, <laughs> when they're away from the Buddhist society, away from the temple, not necessarily the same. So it's very important to realize what is it we take with us throughout our life, throughout the day. And that's the mind, isn't it? And this is what we're working with. The Noble Eightfold Path is not a, you know, a one-hour-a-day path or something like that. That's a 24-7 path. We have this mind, we're working with it, we're training it as best we can, we're training our speech, we're training our actions. So it's a 24-7 practice, and work is a very, very important one for all of us. So this is very, very useful for us to uh, consider anyway. And uh, just to lighten up a little bit, is uh, I'd like to, I think it's Oscar Wilde who said this. Anybody can correct me if they know the, the true author. Oscar Wilde was a famous English writer, late uh, 19th century, early 20th, I think, he passed away. And he said, I love work. I could watch it for hours. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is very true. Uh, often, they probably see it at a Buddhist society more so than other places, or everywhere, actually, it's the same. You know, The number of people that are active, that do the things, probably not so many. But we all like to watch it, and we appreciate watching it. <laughs> And, of course, what does livelihood mean? Of course, uh, in English, it's a, livelihood is not such a common word, but people understand it. It's the way we live our, uh, 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 we earn our living. It's the way we earn our living. And this is a very important 
something that the Buddha emphasized a lot, the way we learn, earn our living. And I'll give another story now, maybe it's too soon, but nevertheless. And this is from Nasruddin, because people, people, people quite like my Nasruddin stories. And, and also when they get tired of them, they can give me other stories, which will be a <laughs> good idea. So one day, Nasruddin, uh, he had a lot of stubble on his face. And um, this man asked him, because he saw him, he was really unkempt, you know, looked, looked a bit rough. We'd say homeless, maybe. And uh, a man asked him, he said, how often do you shave? And then Nasruddin said, oh, 20 or 30 times a day. <laughs> and the other man said, oh, you must be a freak. And Nasruddin said, no, I'm a barber. <laughs> <laughs> and it's probably like... It's probably like all professions. The, the profession that a person practices is often the one that the, the, they neglect for themselves. So often here, about mechanics, they've got the worst cars. <laughs> so it's not good advertising, really, is it? So, and so why is it right livelihood? That's an interesting point. You know, you have all the, the right view and right uh, intention, right motivation, and so on. And it's right because it's good and it's wholesome, it's positive. And it's also right because it leads, this is the most important actually, it leads to the destination of the Noble Eightfold Path. And this is Nibbana, to happiness, to the ultimate happiness. And uh, I was going to mention before I go into what the Buddha said, no, I'll use that later, I think. That's quite interesting. And how did the Buddha define right, uh, right livelihood or right work? And he said, this, I quite like this one actually, and what is right livelihood? There is the case where a disciple of the noble ones, these are the enlightened uh, monks and nuns, and having abandoned dishonest livelihood, keeps his life going with right livelihood. This is called right livelihood. So he keeps his life going, that's quite nice, uh, with right livelihood. So it has that sense that we may not be perfect at it, at uh, our livelihood. And certainly when Ajahn Chah, famous meditation teacher in northeast Thailand, was teaching, many of the villagers were catching animals, killing animals because for their meals and, and also to make money. So it's very difficult because their livelihood often result, uh, uh, depended on, on, on killing animals. But with many of them, as they became, had more and more faith in him, he would manage to uh, encourage them to find other avenues to make their livelihood. And he was very uh, skillful at that. So this is something he worked at gradually, and they worked at gradually too. And how does uh, right livelihood fit in with the other, this is quite good too, with the other factors of the Noble Eightfold Path? And this is where they're very good too. How, and how is right view the forerunner? One discerns or understands wrong livelihood as wrong livelihood and right livelihood as right livelihood. And what is wrong livelihood? This is the interesting part. And he says, the Buddha says, scheming, persuading, hinting, belittling, and pursuing gain with gain. This is wrong livelihood. And I should say, when you read, listen to that list, this really applies particularly to Sangha, monks and nuns, we shouldn't do these things. So if you see us doing any of these things, <laughs> you think, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> so one, and then continues, one tries to abandon wrong livelihood and to enter into right, li right livelihood. This is one's right effort. So this is sama vayama. One is mindful to abandon wrong livelihood and to enter and remain in right livelihood. This is one's right mindfulness. So this is sama sati. So this is very good. This is one's right mindfulness. Thus these three qualities, right view, right effort, and right mindfulness, run and circle around right livelihood. And in that sutta, that teaching the Buddha gave, he did it with each of the factors of the path and has these three qualities. Well, has mindfulness and right effort and each of the qualities very important. So the underlying principle, and if you haven't taken away nothing else from today, the underlying principle of, of right livelihood is it should not cause harm to ourselves and, and harm and suffering, and it shouldn't do, cause harm and suffering to others. So that's the basic. The basic, if right livelihood will be something that doesn't cause us harm 
or suffering and doesn't cause others harm or suffering. That's really the essence, isn't it, of sila. I mean, that's the essence of sila too. A sila is virtue or ethical conduct, so it's aimed at that. And then um, the Buddha talked about what kinds of work, uh, what kind of livelihood is harmful to ourselves and others. And this is where the Buddha talked about the five kinds of livelihood that um, are harmful to others. But I also, I've got the note here that it's harmful to ourselves too because we create bad karma for some, from some of these uh, trades. So, uh, first of all, I mean, the very obviously trade in weapons, that's very obvious, isn't it? Because if people trade in weapons, it's just a, um, a short skip and a jump to killing people and harming people, maiming them. And we have some societies like the US where weapons are are everywhere and you hear terrible stories of people being uh, killed and mass killings. So, so that's pretty obvious. And then there's the trade in living beings. He said living be beings, interesting. So this is, um, you know, people trafficking. We have that these days where people, you know, like the Syrian refugees in the, uh, that are fleeing Syria and going to Europe and they go in boats and people take advantage of them and put them on these terribly dangerous to, to escape. And slavery, of course, very obvious one. Uh, we don't hear about that so much these days, but it's still going, <laughs> still going. And uh, adoption scams, that may be another one. You know, sometimes you hear in China, for instance, people stealing, uh, uh, kidnapping, that's the word you use, babies in order to sell them, you know, as, uh, for adoption. It's really, really terrible. There are worse things, I can tell you. And um, that's uh, refugees, of course, that's the people trafficking. Prostitution is uh, one. This is one that I thought, I, I had never really thought of it in here. I think it may have come from Bhikkhu Bodhi, actually. He says, raising animals for slaughter. This is trade in living beings. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, you think of all the people who have got sheep and cattle. Perhaps that is a wrong livelihood. They may not actually be killing them, so that's uh, certainly they're not making that negative come up. But it says that here, and I thought, mm, maybe. And the next one, this is number three, is trade in meat. So this is uh, meat production. Uh, so that could, that could include, isn't it, farming, grazing animals, yeah. And butchery, of course, killing them, actually killing them. So that's pretty obvious. And uh, poisons... So this is uh, poisons for, um, you know, for killing human beings or pesticides, herbicides. And the big one for all of us is pest control. You know, what, how, how, how much pest control do we use? And I remember one of the members of the Buddhist Society of Western Australia, he was a pest control man. <laughs> So eventually, I think, I hope he got out of that. But he, would, he wouldn't keep the five precepts uh, all the time. But there were occasions he would take the five precepts. And so then he wouldn't be, you know, doing his pest control work, at least for that day. And that is good, because with the five precepts, at least for that day, he's not killing people. At least he's got it in mind, this is not the best thing to do. But it's not an easy thing for any of us, and it's a big dilemma for most Buddhists. What do we do with the pests, with the insects? In Australia, we're very lucky. In Sri Lanka and the tropics, whoa, the ants and all the, all the insects, it's incredible. So you do your best with them, you know. My hut in the forest, of course, in the forest, often, you know, I'm uh, invaded, that's a good word, with ants. So I have to sweep them out, especially if I've gone away for a, short, for a time, come back, and there's masses of them, you know. And in the West, many people would just think, out with a mortine can. <laughs> but as a Buddhist, you can't do that. You've got to think, well, what do I do? So you sweep them out, you do your best. You know you're going to kill some of them, and, and I do my best. I try to use a soft broom to get them out and then take them a bit further away from the kuti, from the heart. So that's very good. And the last one, of course, is uh, intoxicant. So this is alcohol and drugs that uh, uh, cloud one's uh, mindfulness. Uh, and these, this is uh, a trade which the Buddha said a lay follower, follower should not engage in these five trades. And of course, it's very obvious that the intoxicants, all the, they lead to, lead to a lot of the problems in our lives. It's where domestic violence often happens. Many things come from that. And you hear horror stories, don't you, about people on drugs, particularly ice. 
and some of the, the things that happen with them, you know, that they're driving a car and they'll kill five people at a traffic light or something. Whether it's intention, it's hard to say. Other things that the Buddha mentions in other places, this would be a bit controversial, <laughs> is lending money for interest. What about banks? <laughs> anyway, it's just a thought. And this is another good one that uh, in our society people wouldn't would think, really? Uh, the Buddha actually said that acting was a bad, uh, was a, a, a negative profession to be involved in. And it's really a touching um, um, incident where there's a, and he became an enlightened monk, Teliputta, Venerable Teliputta, I think it's Teliputta, you can correct me if I haven't got it right. He was an actor, he was quite a famous actor, he had a troupe of actors and he would go around showing shows, make a big learning and living from this. And he thought he was doing a service because he made people happy, you know, lift them up. But the Buddha, and he asked the Buddha, where will I be reborn as a result of my my activity, my, uh, my acting, thinking, you know, well, it's good karma, isn't it? And the Buddha told him he would be born in the hell of, the, of that laughing hell, I think it was called. <laughs> so probably that's all they did, laugh all the time. So he, that made him, you know, really consider that, uh, and it should make us consider, why is that uh, not a right livelihood? Or the Buddha didn't recommend it, let's put it that way. Is because he's, uh, uh, he said that encouraged uh, delusion. This is moha. You notice that, don't you? We get swept up and, and defilements. You know, we're, we're excited by some things. We're unhappy with other things. We get angry sometimes. You know, all the emotions are really uh, uh, tweaked, are really influenced. So, and of course, the last one are soldiers. And that's pretty obvious too, soldiers, because they, they will be killing people. But there again, you see it in Thailand too, and I'm sure it happens in Sri Lanka, Buddhist countries. <laughs> Soldiers are aware of this, so they try to do meritorious things, we call them, make a lot of positive merit, good karma, and so to offset you know, the negative karma they've made of killing, of killing people. Um, so that's uh, the best they can do. You know, obviously good if they can avoid it. So I'll give you another Nazarudin story. This one I don't think I've ever told here before, so it's quite good. I think it's a really neat one. Nazarudin is very funny because they're not only that funny, the stories, but if you ponder them, they've got a deeper point too. And that's the, the whole point. They're actually teaching stories. And I think the, he's a, he was a Sufi. The idea is you ponder it and ponder it and it will take you deeper and deeper. But some of the stories will, some won't. It depends, it depends on you. And uh, one day, Nazarudin was writing a letter for a villager because he was literate, he could, he could write, and uh, the villager couldn't. But the villager asked him after he'd written the letter, could you read it back to me, please? And Nazarudin couldn't. <laughs> he couldn't read it back, he couldn't read his own writing. Maybe he needed glasses. <laughs> and the villager said to him, if you can't read it, who's going to, who's going to be able to read it? And Nazarudin said, that's not my problem. My job is to write the letter, not read it. <laughs> and then the villager said, well, anyway, it's not addressed to you. <laughs> so, so that's Nazarudin's job as a, as a professional writer. So it's good, always interesting. So the important thing with right livelihood, that is, the, as, as I mentioned, it doesn't harm us and doesn't harm others. And the very much that is a case of not breaking the precepts mentioned, particularly in right speech and right action. So any, any, uh, any job, any occupation we have that breaks those, uh, those precepts the, of uh, not killing and not stealing and no sexual misconduct. First of all, those ones, that's right action. Uh, that's wrong action, actually. <laughs> Avoiding those things, and um, if we if we avoid those, if our livelihood, if our job doesn't entail us to do any of those things, you know, we're not uh, not asked to kill. Soldiers are, <laughs> sometimes policemen are, aren't they? They're often asked to kill. If but usually one would hope for both in both cases they do it reluctantly and only uh, to protect their lives and in particular situations. And not stealing, um, you know, that can be taken to 
very fine uh, degrees. But uh, if we're in an occupation where we know that we're actually ripping people off, then we have to have second thoughts about that occupation. And there's a story and uh, no sexual misconduct. So this is particularly important these days when we have a lot of sexual harassment and we have a, in the news a lot of uh, sexual abuse is being reported in different professions, particularly the acting profession, you know, the, the, uh, the acting uh, movies and so on. So this is also an area, if that is required in one's job, one should have second thoughts about. So this, of course, means prostitution is, is, is not a, a good thing in, in that case. And uh, again, I will, uh, uh, talking about not stealing, mention Nasrudin again. This is one I've told before. And one day, Nasrudin was caught uh, pouring his neighbor's wheat from the neighbor's jar into his jar in the communal store. And he was taken to court and the magistrate, and he said to the magistrate, he said, I am a fool. I don't know their wheat from my wheat. And then the magistrate, who was pretty sharp, said, why didn't you pour your wheat into their wheat in that case? And he said, ah, but I know my wheat from their wheat. <laughs> We're like that, actually. <laughs> Most people are like that. So that's quite a good one. So that's right action. So that's no killing, that's uh, not to kill, not to steal, and no sexual misconduct. The other uh, aspect of the Noble Eightfold Path to deal with our ethical conduct is right speech, of course. Sam, um, samawacha. And that's not lying, musawada, not lying. Not um, using divisive speech, so we divide people one from the other, telling Either, it can be sometimes true, you know, you might tell somebody else uh, something that's true, but you have the intention, ah, if I tell them, that'll put them against the other person. And sometimes it's a lie. Harsh speech, of course, we get quite a lot of that in Australia. You know, there's a swearing and abusing and a harsh tone when people yell at other people, uh, abuse them. This is verbal abuse, isn't it, really? Verbal abuse. Parusavacha. Yeah. And gossip and frivolous speech. And this uh, is a, uh, something we should try to avoid in our uh, livelihoods as well. That can be difficult if you're a gossip columnist. <laughs> if you're a gossip columnist, that's your livelihood, isn't it? So That's an area, again, I think it's very similar to the acting, perhaps, that it's encouraging people to be scattered, to encourage delusion, also to encourage, you know, uh, um, Focus on things that are not that important. You know, what colour dress the Princess uh, Megan, I suppose you say Princess Megan, wears, Duchess of whatever, wears is not that important really, but we'll get big uh, media coverage. So we keep that in mind, you know, that what is important in our life? These things are not, they're actually usually, you know, just pleasant distractions in a way, you know, aren't they? And I can see it, you know, news is very addictive. If you can see it on the internet now, there's lots of apps that you can get and you can watch the news and you can see it from every angle. It's amazing. And there are things that we should, uh, that are important to consider in relation to uh, right livelihood, how we, li how we make our living. And the first, first one, and this feels, fits in with Sela, so it's a general principle that it should be earned ethically. It shouldn't be by illegal means. It should be by legal means. Some, so things that are against the law, we shouldn't be making our living that way. And there's plenty of things that are against the law that people are making money from. And there's obviously a demand for it. You know, so we have crime, we have drugs, we have money laundering, prostitution, all these things. And it gets, that can get very subtle too, because one time somebody, I think last, when I talked about this uh, in brief, before, somebody mentioned that some of the super schemes that people, you know, have, the investment por portfolios they have, some of them are not ethical. They're actually investments with companies, businesses that are not basically ethical. They may make a lot of money, <laughs> but we don't know that, actually. We don't know that. So um, it's, a, it's something to keep in mind if we can. And our, li our um, livelihood, our living should be made by peaceful means, 
without coercion, without force, without violence. So no intimidation and uh, um, this is more like uh, almost criminal, isn't it, in a, way, in a way? But sometimes in a work environment too, you can get people who are very intimidating and uh, very negative, so which can be uh, something you have to deal with. And it should be acquired honestly. That's, that, that relates, of course, too, to ethically. It should be acquired honestly, not by deceit or tricker, trickery, not uh, deceiving people. And um, Bhikkhu, uh, of course, we have in the uh, uh, Mahamangala Sutta, people know this, Anakula Chakamanta Etang Mangala Muttamang. And Bhikkhu Bodhi is translating that now as an honest occupation. Sometimes it's sort of like a simple or straightforward, peaceful occupation. This is the highest blessing, an honest occupation. And uh, that certainly leads to a lot less stress in one's life if it's an honest occupation. You don't have to go home with lots of echoes of, oh my goodness, what's the goodness what do I do? <laughs> so, and um, also for monks and nuns, there's quite a few things that the Buddha recommended, uh, activities that we shouldn't do. Um, they're not, they're not, uh, not something he said that the lay community can't do. But if you see any of this, it's, it may be uh, it's useful just to mention it. If you see monks and nuns doing it, then you can say, no, <laughs> no, Bhante. <laughs> Perhaps, you know, people feel shy to do that. So running errands, we shouldn't run erring, errands, uh, you know, take messages for people, uh, that sort of thing. We shouldn't be buying and selling. Monks and nuns shouldn't be using money. Um, in Buddhist countries, it happens a lot. <laughs> monks and nuns are using money. <laughs> And we shouldn't be cheating with false weights and measures. That probably comes from making the money, doesn't it, really? And this is a very controversial one, or uh, I think people who live from, come from a Buddhist country will realise we shouldn't be in, engaging in astrology and palmistry and these sorts of predictive things. Of course, in Buddhist countries in Sri Lanka, the best astrologers? Monks. <laughs> Some of the best, the most popular, most famous. So there we are, that's not a, a good thing. Uh, and also we shouldn't be engaged in matchmaking. That's always a hazardous, <laughs> hazardous occupation at the best of times, isn't it? Especially if people get disgruntled with your matchmaking. And we shouldn't be acting as doctors for the same reason, you know, that people, um, people will, uh, if uh, it, it takes us away from the main purpose of our lives as monks and nuns, but also involves us in controversy, can involve us in controversy and, and a lot more involvement than we should have. And other, in any way, there are doctors, lay doctors, so that's enough. So there are other things that the Buddha mentioned, particularly in reference to monks, we shouldn't, uh, and nuns, Restraint from deceiving others is important too. So, and this is very true for, for all of us, really. T trickery is one thing. So we're not tricking people into believing something to be the case that isn't. So, for instance, you know, a monk or a nun who might... This is an example from monks and nuns, anyway. Who might be sort of indicating that they have deep meditation and misleading people that they have when they don't, that sort of thing. They can't actually pretend that they are enlightened and they're not because if they do that that's a disrobing offense they're no longer a monk or a nun if they do it deliberately and other things that we should avoid is and it's good for everyone to remember pleasing talk or ingratiating talk this is the sort of saying the things people want to hear so that they will make offerings in terms of uh, monks and nuns and uh, monks and nuns particularly we shouldn't be hinting or insinuating we want this we want that and we shouldn't be harassing donors too, the, 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 the dikers and, you know, oh, why haven't you bought this, <laughs> you know, or whatever it is. And we should be actually easy to support in the, uh, the Metta Sutta. We just had that, didn't we? Easy to support, light, light, uh, not a burden to others, frugal in our ways. And the Buddha always talked about the, the, uh, that we should have fewness of wishes, fewness of desires. That makes us easy to support. And actually, fewness of desires also makes us happier. The more desires you have, the more wants you have in life, the more unhappy you are. The more your happiness is on hold until you get that desire. And while you haven't got it, you're not happy. <laughs> so, 
if we can reduce our desires and wants, this is actually the path to abandoning craving, tanha, and this is the path for happiness. But we're so used to having desires, one thinking they'll be they're a form of happiness, but the the happiness in the future, the never never, as we can often say. So, and the other things that the, the Buddha mentioned before monks and nuns particularly is that we should avoid lowly, low worldly knowledges, knowledge. Uh, you know, and the example was astrology, palmistry, uh, bodily marks, etc. But it can also be, you know, monks in um, in Buddhist countries get into all sorts of occupations. You know, I've even heard uh, of a scam where a monk was getting visas for people, but wasn't really doing that, and things like that. So, and in Sri Lanka, and I don't think in Thailand there are there are monks and uh, no nuns actually in Parliament. So that's another thing, isn't it? How amazing. Could you imagine monks in parliament in Canberra? <laughs> be extraordinary, wouldn't it? They'd get a lot of media attention, I think, just from, the, from wearing the robes. So these are not good professions. And in Sri Lanka, of course, monks and uh, not so much the nuns do teaching and things like that in schools. But they may be teaching things like Sinhala, the, the Sinhalese, the language of Sri Lanka and so on, which is not exactly, you know, Dhamma. So, but anyway. And very importantly, I was going to mention, this actually I think is vital. It's not covered by the five wrong sorts of the, or the, uh, yes, for wrong sorts of livelihood. But it is... The way we um, is the way we perform our work part of a right livelihood. I would, I would argue that it is, and it's certainly part of the path. Certainly part of the path, because at the end of the day, if in our work, if we're encouraging, if we're developing negative, unwholesome qualities, that's not good for our spiritual development, not good for our happiness. On the other hand, if we're developing positive qualities, wholesome qualities. That will make us feel happy, make us feel satisfied that the work we're doing is good, it's beneficial, helpful, uh, for us at least, you know, and then we can develop on the path. So this is very important. So, and this comes from a Thai commentary actually about, because uh, uh, Buddha never really talked in great detail about this, you know, at work. Um, but there's a Thai commentary called the Five, translated in English, I think it's called the Five Ennoblers. Five Ennoblers. This is the, what is it? Five Precepts. <laughs> it's pretty good, isn't it? They have a very nice term, Ennoblers, but it's not really a common English word, is it? Yeah. So, in that, they talk about the, the duties uh, of when we're in a work environment. And duties are part of our livelihood. And for the workers and for the bosses, I think this goes both ways, we need to fulfill things like this. Not idling away our time, you know, not wasting time, not claiming to have worked longer hours than we have, that's, that's good, or pocketing the company's goods. That, that applies for both the workers and the bosses. Sometimes the bosses pocket more <laughs> than the workers. They get a lot of the frills. So you hear about these sorts of things. Yeah. And the other aspect is the people side of it, and this is the human resources. I think this is what we call it these days. And uh, in this uh, Thai commentary, they say we should have due respect and consideration for employers, employees, colleagues, and customers. So due consideration, this is kindly consideration, uh, thoughtful. And it should avoid things like, uh, you know, sexual harassment for sure. There's no place in the workplace for sexual harassment. People are there to work. <laughs> They're not there to be sexually harassed. So this is uh, something we read about, hear about on the news all the time. And because it's such a strong drive in human nature, it's one of one very, uh, we'd say in Buddhism, it's almost like a root defilement. It's one of the very strong ones, you know, this... Uh, interest in sex, sexuality, it's very deep within us. So, you know, the opposite of that, of course, is treating people with kindness, thoughtfulness and compassion. And that's very nice if we can do that. And when we're doing that, it's not as if that we're just doing it for them, you know, so they feel good. We're doing it for ourselves, because when, we when we have those states of mind, we have that wish to be kind to people, we're thoughtful and compassionate. We have got a good heart. We've got a good heart. And um, the other thing it mentioned is that an employer should assign work due to ability, 
Well, that's nice. This is very Buddhist, actually, but it's uh, Buddha didn't say that. I'd, maybe, uh, yes. And uh, to pay adequate wages, very good. And so just to lighten up here, I'll tell another Nasrudin story. I have a few today. <laughs> and this was, uh, Nasrudin had some good news for the king. And he knew he'd get a reward from the king when he gave him this news, because the king was going to be very pleased. And the chamberlain, he, he told the chamberlain who organised the audiences for the king, you know, he had some good news, and the chamberlain knew, aha, this means a big reward, you know, and maybe even told him what the news was. And so the chamberlain said, I'll, give, I'll arrange an audience, but only if you give me 50% of the reward. And Nazarene said, that's a deal. <laughs> so he saw the king. The king was overjoyed at the news. And he said, whatever you wish, I will grant. And so Nazarene said, I want 50 lashes of the whip. <laughs> and after 25 lashes, he said, stop. He said, my partner, my pa bring my partner in to give him the other half of the reward. <laughs> so the chamberlain was born. <laughs> Isn't he crafty? <laughs> So that's, uh, that's getting rewards. That's supposed to be under the idea of adequate wages, but I don't know about that idea. So an employer should also give promotions and vacations. This is very nice. And colleagues should try not to compete, but uh, should try to cooperate. And this is a, an important thing for a work environment. If it's, uh, everybody's out to look after themselves and it's a very insecure work environment. Productivity goes down, happiness certainly goes down. Not pleasant. And a merchant should deal fairly with customers. And this, actually I can put it in here now. Where have I got it? This is a quote from the tea packet. You probably all have read this on the tea packet. Uh, from Dilma T. Do you, do, you reckon, do you remember the quote that comes with that? And it's from Meryl Fernando, who's the founder of Dilma Tea, which is a Sri Lankan tea company, of course. <laughs> and he said, and I think it's very nice, actually, if, it's, you know, if it is the case in the business. Business is a matter of human service. And so I just ask, is that true or not? It, when I think about it, yeah, it can be. You're providing something people need. Admittedly, you're charging for it, yeah but you're providing it, and often people provide, try to do the best they can for their customers. They're not there to rip them off. Some companies are, uh, just to make the money. But often, you know, for uh, companies, particularly a company like Dilma and these small companies that are family ones, they're there because it's their interest, or he would say his passion. So that's it. Business is a matter of human service. That's a nice way of looking at it, actually. I think very good. So that's a, you know, that way they can make uh, their livelihood. Uh, so that fits in better there, I think. And another aspect that this Thai um, uh, commentary mentions, pretty thorough actually, is products and services. And it says that we should present our goods and services uh, truthfully, accurately not deceive with the advertising. Often with the advertising, don't you see, you read that, it sounds fantastic. And then you see the little asterisk, and you say, oh no, oh no, the little asterisk. <laughs> but very few people go to read what the little asterisk, asterisk says, because it's usually almost unreadable. <laughs> so, so this is very, very important, that we give a truthful representation of what, uh, what's being uh, sold or uh, offered not a misrepresentation of the quality or the quantity, not misleading, no dishonesty. So in recent times we've had car manufacturers, and I think I've heard of another one, who's falsified their claims for emissions, and, and uh, I remember a few years ago, of course, that led to a lot of trouble for that company, you know, so Volkswagen, so. But I think now another company's involved. And so this is something we can uh, keep in mind. and. Another Nasruddin story. Nasruddin went to the markets one day and he saw these parrots were being sold and they were going for a phenomenal price because they were talking parrots. So Nasruddin thought, ah, I can make a lot of money. So the next week he bought his chicken, his hen, to the market. 
And he tried to sell her for as much as possible. And people said, Nasruddin, this chicken doesn't talk. The parrots talk. Ah, he said, ah, this hen has wonderful thoughts and she doesn't annoy people with her chatter. <laughs> so she has wonderful thoughts and she doesn't annoy people with her chatter. But he was trying to you know, misrepresent his hen, actually. <laughs> so, so work as part of our practice is an important thing because, you know, if we think of our lives as practice, that's a much more skillful way to view our lives. And it's not only, you know, at home when we have difficult times, when we, dif we have difficulties within the family, with our relationships. These are areas we, we need to practice. And these are areas where we can learn a lot from, we can grow a lot from. They're not always easy, especially if they're major upsets in the family, deaths in the families, breakdown of relationships, losing job, losing house. Many things are very difficult. But they're part, if they're seen as part of our practice, it gives us a different way of relating to it. Instead of it being the, the overwhelming tragedy that it already is, we see it as part of the practice, something we can work with. And that changes our relationship because too often we just get really overwhelmed with it and we can't use our knowledge, our understanding. We, can't, uh, we don't think of our practice at those times. So every aspect of our life is an opportunity to practice and to learn. It's not always easy. And at work, of course, you know, we can, <laughs> a very useful thing to develop is the um, kanti. Kanti, we say patience, isn't it? And patience is, uh, uh, Ajahn Chah often called it patient, patient endurance. But it shouldn't have that negative aspect of, uh, you know, dosa or ill will or uh, anger, so irritation. It has to be with metta, you know, for ourselves that we can bear with what's going on. So that's important. And of course, any of the uh, Brahma Viharas, we call them. So that's metta or maitri, uh, loving kindness, friendliness. Karuna, compassion, uh, feeling for other people's difficulties and, and willing to help them. And also joy for other people's successes and good qualities. I get a lot of joy out of other people's good qualities. And it gives me an idea of how I can develop that quality. And of course, Upeka, this balanced state of mind that sees uh, that people have, we have our own karma and we try the best to help others, but we can't always, um, you know, uh, help them in the way we would like to see them go. And so we let them, let them go their way. So also, we need, uh, particularly, and of course, this is, uh, these qualities are part of right intention, right uh, motivation. So this is uh, uh, Sama Sankapa, the Noble Eightfold Path. And it's non ill will. This is metta, maitri, uh, non harming. And this is like karuna compassion. So very, very useful things to develop. And there's also some in, in the Sama Sankapa, there's Nekama. This is usually called renunciation. Ajahn Brahm calls it letting go. And it's, sometimes we have, have to let go of how we want things to be uh, in, for the group harmony. And uh, sometimes this is a useful thing to do, you know, can be. Not all the time, you know, it's, but it's useful. And of course, when we're uh, doing our work, we're developing right mindfulness and right samadhi. Because if to be really successful, efficient at your work, you have to be there, you have to be present. Unfortunately, we are these days multitasking all the time. <laughs> so we're here, there and everywhere. And the attention we can give to what we're doing is uh, uh, momentary almost, momentary. So the more we can stay with what we're doing, being present, see that as our uh, meditation object, kamatana, the better the work will be, the more enjoyable our work would be. Too often we want to just get it out of the way so we can do what we want. Maybe look at the smartphone, <laughs> check Facebook or whatever it is. So mindfulness we can encourage. And also samadhi, as I say, that ability to focus in, to look in detail at things, to really uh, um, zoom in. That's the word you can use, can't you? So we do things to, that way to the best of our ability. And that's very, very useful. And we'll enjoy it. The sense of satisfaction there too, isn't there? So, and this is a positive, a positive thing. 
And of course, as I mentioned, right action, we're giving up the unwholesome, developing the wholesome, and we're not involved in uh, wrong speech or wrong action. But sometimes there are difficult work situations, and I think everyone here probably has had, has experienced this, and so what to do in, in those situations. But to always bring the Dhamma to mind is very, very important. Uh, not to just fly off the handle and react. That's what we always do. Just to, to use our wisdom, and the, what we've grown, what uh, wisdom we've developed from our Dhamma practice, what good qualities of metta, of maitri, uh, loving kindness, of karuna, compassion, and joy with other people's success and so on that we've developed. Sometimes when people are being extraordinarily difficult, it is helpful to think that you know they must be having a lot of difficulties in their life, there's suffering in their lives, for them to behave like this, speak like this, that can be helpful. And um, you know, Arjun Brahm often says when people are like that, you can think, well, they're like, they're insane, they're crazy, temporarily. <laughs> Fortunately, hopefully, temporarily. <laughs> so, and that's another way to look at uh, someone who's being really, really difficult. Arjun Brahm has another skillful means that I like, you know, he says, you know, if you know somebody has got cancer and they're being really obnoxious, will you get that upset with them? You think, oh my goodness, this person's got cancer. He said, so everyone you meet that's angry, annoyed, really caught up in this negativity, think of them as someone with cancer. They've got mental cancer for sure. <laughs> so, and that can help us because we have a different perspective when we know somebody's got a terminal illness. So... We've all got a terminal illness, actually, but nevertheless. <laughs> and the important thing to remember, these difficult situations are where we grow from. Uh, often the more difficult, the more challenging, the greater the growth. And that's not easy at that time. And I often think, you know, when my father passed away, very suddenly he had a heart attack and he'd come back from a trip. I hadn't even seen him since he came back. And then I get a telephone call at work, or was at work, that he passed away. I couldn't believe it, couldn't believe it when I went. And, um, you know, that was a real shock. But from that, I really felt a lot of growth came, you know, and interest in developing the spiritual path. And not uh, two or three years after that, I became a monk. So it was, it was like, it was very difficult, but it was um, something that gave rise to a lot of growth. And even sometimes these relationship breakups that people have, you know, they really, really cut them up, as, as people say. And I know when I was in Colombo, I was talking to a young man who just split up with his wife. Uh, she wanted a divorce. Uh, and he only knew about it three weeks before, you know. He thought everything was going okay. So he was shell-shocked. So these, I told him, you know, maybe down the track, you, you know, you will thank her just as... We can think, if Ajahn Chah, for instance, he had a girlfriend, and he, they both lo loved each other, actually, and then she married somebody else. The family wanted her to marry somebody else. And it really broke his heart. But, and he said, even for the first seven years he was a monk, he still thought of her, actually, for seven years, you know. But I think, had he actually married her, <laughs> we wouldn't have Ajahn Chah. We wouldn't have that wisdom. <laughs> we wouldn't have, you know... All that, all the humour too, and humanness, you know, it was fantastic. So I think he thought, thank you to that, to that, uh, that woman, who may have, may have become actually a disciple of his later, you know, when he founded his monastery. But of course, you know, we have to think too, if the, uh, if the uh, work environment is, and I think people use this term a lot, toxic, we have to decide, yep, that's enough, and change. Because sometimes we are in environments that, you know, can be really negative. And the only thing to do is really pull the plug and leave. But we have to see. Sometimes financially that's difficult. You don't get those choices very easily. But in, in a very real sense, it's for our well-being and happiness. Because if you live in a, a very toxic environment, emotionally, mentally, it will affect you know, one's spiritual, uh, one's happiness for sure and development. So it's in our interest to make a change, even if it's risky, you know, but to, to, to move away from those sorts of environments because we have a choice. Most people have a choice. So I'd like to finish there talking about right livelihood and I think the principle, general principle is not harming ourselves, not harming others. 
And if we keep that in mind, you know, we don't need all the details. We just need to ask ourselves, is this really harming me or is it harming somebody else? Is this benefiting me? Is it benefiting others? You know, that's, a good, that's good enough, really, a good standard. So I'd like to encourage everybody to reflect about their livelihoods, whatever your livelihood may be now, and uh, you know, to bring Dhamma into your work, to see it as part of your Dhamma practice so that you grow from it and uh, you grow good qualities of the, um, in understanding and in the heart too. And this is the way of bringing, ha will bring us happiness here and now and in future lives, we'll say. So now I'd like to just to briefly uh, open up for any questions, if there are any questions. I'm sure there are many people who have lots of dilemmas about uh, their livelihood. There's always difficulties, you know, about livelihood. Are there any questions? I often say, any questions, comments, or complaints? <laughs> <laughs> I've had complaints, but it's quite good. I like it. Yeah, there we are, hand up there. That's very good. This is good because after meditation sessions, I ask for questions and there's never any. <laughs> I think that's good. I say great. That means their minds were peaceful. Yes, what would you like? Um, Ajahn, I'd just like to ask you a question in regards to one of the five precepts. Yes. So taking... The life of another being. Mm. So if we are considering euthanasia, what yes. does Buddhism say about that? Yes, that's, all, that's a very difficult one, actually, euthanasia. And for monks and nuns, we cannot, we cannot uh, say, go ahead and do it, because uh, if we do that, then we are, that's a disrobal offence. That's called a parajika, and then we're no longer a monk or nun if we encourage somebody to take another being's life. So, but I think that's a choice that people often are faced with, isn't it? And uh, sometimes uh, it's a very difficult choice and they have to make up their mind about it. You know, if it's a, a family member and do you turn off the life support system? Is that killing them? You know, and people, Buddhists will worry too, you know, if I turn off the life support system for mum or dad, is that, is that killing mum and dad? You know, these are very difficult questions to answer, really. They are very difficult. But of course, you know, we all, always should remember in Buddhism, and the Buddha said this over and over again, that intention is karma. That's what's causing the good karma and the unwholesome karma, the negative. So it depends very much on our intention as to the result that will come from that. So if it's a negative intention, if we're killing... A being, for instance, with a lot of anger and rage and uh, hatred, wow, the, the karmic effect of that would be enormous. If we're killing a being reluctantly uh, out of um, compassion and so on, it will be different. But uh, I think in Buddhism we always say it would be somewhat negative to do that. So it's something we have to make up our own minds about. I certainly can't endorse one side or the other. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's something, it is difficult, it's difficult. And I think the best way is, of course, family members to talk about it and uh, resolve it before they uh, take an action like euthanasia, turning off life support systems. I'm sure they do, and they get advice from professionals these days so they can consider all aspects of it. So that's important. So... Um, that's, I'd say that's all I could say about uh, using it. It's a whole area, actually, a whole talk in a way, and it's a difficult one for everyone, I think. You know. So thank you for that question. I hope that's sort of... But intention is really the heart of it, what we intend you know, and where we're coming from, you know, that, that intention. Is it coming from a lot of negativity or coming from, from uh, a, a better place of you know, compassion and uh, um, wanting to help? So. Mm. There we are. Are there any other questions? Before the last question before we end, yes. Uh, one more comment. Ah, oh, comment. Good. Comment. Good. 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 So, um, yeah, w working in the uh, toxic environment, like uh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, like you said, uh, it's it's quite hard to find a job. So, if you, if if you find you know difficult to find another job, you can always come to BSV for uh, once a week meditation, oh, and will, that will do the de detox. <laughs> yeah, yeah, detox yeah. for the mind. Yeah. No, it's difficult. That's good. That was an advertisement. <laughs> no, that's good. Because... It's not, it's not from a marketing department. <laughs>
Yes, <laughs> right. That's very good. So I think now we can just. Uh, if, uh, another question? Any other question? One, one more, and then we finish. Pay respects to Buddha Dhamma and Sangha. Nice to finish off. Yes. There's one at the back too. Oh no, no, no! I think you were first. Oh, you too then. Quick, quick ones. Thank you for your talk, Ajahn. All right, good, good. I hope it's. I'm just wondering. I'm just querying. Can monk be depressed? Oh, can monks be depressed? Yeah. Of course, yes, yes. Yeah, I was just wondering because mm. w with the lifestyle, mm. um, in terms of the symptoms of depression, because mm. uh, myself is a GP. No, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so mm. if you look at it, you know, um, you don't have any entertainment, you don't go shopping, and mm. you don't watch movie. <laughs> and if you ask any psychiatrist, do you think that, you know, you have the signs and symptoms of depression? Oh, right. Yeah. Right. A lack so, of interest in the world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's quite funny. <laughs> yes, and of course the answer to that is, you know, that we, monks' life, nuns' life, actually all Buddhist practitioners' lives really, are encouraged, we're encouraged to look for the happiness in the, the right place, the real place, the sorts of happiness. It's not out there through the sense pleasures, that's what we're used to, and it is happiness. You know, you see a nice video, you have a nice meal, you chat with somebody, you hear a wonderful, some wonderful music, whatever. That is happiness. But really, where it's all coming from is inside us. We all know that. So far from being depressed, the Buddha is actually encouraging us to mind the source of that happiness, go to the source and develop that. And that's not always a, a simple thing. It's not straightforward. It's a, it's a difficult task. It takes time. But the whole point of it is to grow more and more happiness inside. If we don't have happiness, then the meditation won't flourish. Then the mind can't come together. It's the Buddha said the cause for the mind coming together is happiness. There has to be this positive energy in the mind for that to happen. So hopefully, you know, I can say the answer to that is that we're looking for happiness in the right place, inside and not outside. So it can look as if we're not, uh, um, uh, you know... Uh, We've, we're lacking in the external happiness, but we are actually looking for the happiness in the right place, inside. The gold mine, <laughs> the treasure. That's where it's all coming from, for all of us actually, not just for monks and nuns. So I hope that answered that. Did you have one question? We can just finish. Just yeah, just have a little, and there we have. Just. Then, um, in the Buddhist time, uh, technology is often. Ah, technology, yes. On mute. Oh, that's Ajahn, yes. um, uh, in the Buddhist time, technology is not as advanced as today. So when the when is it about uh, not you know not uh, what I'm thinking about is is the about the the trait which potentially kills people. And with technology nowadays, hmm. we can be engaged in developing components which can be used in lots of things some mm, some, mm. some in in mm. medical technology mm. but some in uh, potentially weapons as mm. well so i was just wondering what what your view is on that yes yes because it depend yes it it can be used in a number of different ways and so for instance you know you think of there's nuclear medicine, isn't there? <laughs> but there's also nuclear weapons. <laughs> so it does go both ways. Yeah, so those, those sorts of uh, occupations or livelihoods that, in, uh, that are using it for those ends, you know, would be wrong livelihood, would be a livelihood that doesn't, leads to the harm of others. So in that case, the, the Buddha would advise people as much as possible to steer away from them. It's very, it can be difficult in some cases. A lot of times you don't even know. You don't know it, that's the trouble actually. Yeah, you don't know. Yeah, you just Yes, that's, that's true. You, they don't, you don't know how they will use what you're, you're making actually. And it can be a component in, in a sort of a weapon or something that's used for, for killing beings and so on. So it's, uh, you know, it's something that, we can only do according to what we know, actually, and if we're aware of. And uh, it's, um, as I say, as much as possible, we try to avoid harming others and, uh, and harming ourselves as well. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting case because it's like that uh, situation with, uh, you know, investment portfolios, be it for superannuation or whatever, 
you know, sometimes the, the portfolios have unethical business investments, you know, that they are actually doing damage to the environment, to people's lives. But we don't know. <laughs> But certainly if people know, then they have a choice of saying, no, I don't want to be part of that portfolio, or maybe that company offering that uh, investment strategy. So, so it's a matter of how informed we are. Intention. Uh, intention, it comes, yeah, very important, yeah, intention, yes. Intention not to, to harm, not to, uh, to kill, those sorts of intentions. So, and sort of to, to bring as much... Uh, benefit as possible in the world. Things are difficult enough. <laughs> difficult enough. So if you contribute something good, wonderful. That's great. For our benefit and for others. So I'd like to finish there. And uh, now if you'd like to, you're welcome to pay respects to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, where it all came from. <laughs> okay.